created for purpose, a unique genetic blueprint from the moment of conception. DNA woven together to determine gender, eye color, hair color, fearfully and wonderfully made, valued beyond measure. Our culture says life is disposable, her rights matter most, it's not really a baby, and it's all one big choice. But God created us in his own image and whispered, I have called you by name, you are mine. In the United States, abortion is legal throughout the entire pregnancy, totally unrestricted. Most recently, abortion has been boxed up in the form of two little pills and a promise to make it all go away. What will you do to make a difference for life? How can you be a voice? Will you help save a life? There are over 2,700 pregnancy centers in the United States, serving men and women free of charge and full of hope, providing pregnancy tests, life-affirming counsel, abortion recovery, classes, clothing, and diapers. Many centers offer the first glimpse of a woman's baby in the womb displaying the magnificence of creation and the precious beats of a tiny heart, perfectly formed and fashioned by the one who created them. They serve faithfully, love well, encourage, they are hope dealers. They need volunteers, your prayers and your financial support. Will you please give generously and help make a difference for life today? On the Sanctity of Life Sunday, First Baptist Bernie is proud to call Hill Country Pregnancy Center a local mission partner. This means that we give monthly to support their great work. Furthermore, we have many members who volunteer faithfully. You need to know that you can. They are always in need. And we even have some who serve on the board because we value each and every life. First Baptist has other partners as well, one of which is Vault, is one of our ministry partners who helps support foster care families. And you need to know this, because I'm really excited, starting next Sunday, we are resuming our side-by-side -side growth group class. That is a special growth group class for adults with special needs. Karen Murphy has been working uh, very hard uh, with Kathy Smith and others to get that back up and running. And so as we talk about valuing each and every life, this ministry is so very important. Beloved, we need to be in prayer, specifically this year, because the Supreme Court will hear a vital case, Dobbs versus Jackson, in the fight against abortion. I know that it seems that the fight is long, okay? Weary, going all the way back to 1973 when women were given the right to abort a child simply due to inconvenience and to chase prosperity. How many times have boyfriends, parents, friends said, terminate that child so that it doesn't alter or bother our plans? This is a great evil, one that, spits in the face of God. We must not grow weary in praying that it ends in our country. Did you know that in the ancient Roman world, there was a common practice uh, of infanticide called exposing? That is, any child who wasn't wanted would simply be left outside on its own to die. Very commonly in a trash heap. And the most common reason for exposing a child was simply because she was a female. We actually have a recorded letter from history uh, from a husband uh, who is actually tender and caring towards his wife. But the practice had become so common, he writes her and he says to her, if you give birth while I am away and it is a girl, expose her. But over the course of the first three centuries, 
Christians began to quietly adopt these children, believing that they had great value because they were made in the image of God and they showed selfless, sacrificial love. And then the tide of culture began to change. It began to turn and exposure became less and less common. Life gained value. And in 318, Constantine uh, declared exposure a crime, and by 374, it became a capital offense. I share all this with you so that you remember and understand that we value life. The Bible teaches us that every, every individual has been made in his image, and you and I are called to pray to that end. So this morning, will you pray with me? Can we pray collectively as a church? Our Heavenly Father, we pray very specifically this day, knowing that the Supreme Court is going to hear such an important case against abortion. Father, we pray that your will, as it is in heaven, will be done on earth, and that the value and the sanctity, the importance that you have placed on life, God, that that will reign true. Father, we pray that this evil will be eradicated. We pray for Christians to sacrificially enter in to the messiness and the difficulty of life. We pray for our Hill Country Pregnancy Center. We pray for Vault Foster Care. We pray for these important areas. Father, where you are calling Christians to be your hands and your feet in the difficult circumstances of life and to value it. Father, we also pray for those women and those families who have been affected by abortion. Father, we pray that they would find healing at the foot of the cross, that you would heal and redeem, that you would be the lifter of heads, and that you would show life and a path forward. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> all right, this morning we're going to be beginning a, a new sermon series uh, so turn with me in your Bible to the book of Psalms, okay, Psalm 139. There's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you if you do not have one. Uh, please take that, make it a gift from us. But we're going to be walking through uh, an assorted uh, section of Psalms, mainly because what the Psalms teach us is how to find God in the midst of the messiness of life. You need to hear me say, as your pastor, I continually read through the Psalms. So my personal reading plan, I read somewhere in the New Testament, somewhere in the Old Testament, and I continually read through the Psalms because the Psalms make sure that your heart is tender and connected, that you are in love with God in a personal relationship, okay? Okay. Now, Psalm 139, some of you may have rolled your eyes because you have seen this and all of these verses cross-stitched on a pillow, and you think, uh, this is far too feminine of a psalm. But the reality is, is this psalm is filled with the riches of life of God's word, okay? And so I need you to stand out of respect and honor for God's word as we read Psalm 139, okay? But let me give you this final quick warning before we read it. I want you to listen for um, its anthropomorphic language. I know, a giant word that just means that God is humanized here. So the God who already knows all, already is present everywhere, Listen to the way the psalm describes him as a heavenly father that is in pursuit of us. Because if we will get that to move from here to here, everything changes. Okay, all right, so listen, Psalm 139, I'm reading out of the New American Standard. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. 
You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately equated with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful me. It is, it is too high. I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed and shield, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn and I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I wake, you are still, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed, for they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred, and they have become my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know, any anxi- and know my anxious thoughts and see if there is any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. You may be seated. All right, so I know that you cringe a little bit when I read verses 19 through 20. Uh, Sorry, 19 through 22. And you said in your mind, well, that is not very nice, okay? Most often, preachers just exclude that entire section, right? We're just gonna stop at 18, and then we might skip down uh, to the final two verses. But here's the deal. You need to understand that as we read the Psalms, that many of them are written out of specific life situations, Okay, the first few that we're gonna read here this spring and walk through, you will see David has opposition. He has enemies that are surrounding him. And that is the context for his writing. Here, we don't know a great deal about the context or the opposition that he faces, except um, what we can glean for how and why he is writing about God. So apparently his enemies are stirring up lies about God. They are accentuating David's own insecurities and causing anxious thoughts. And so in response to that, David sits down and he pins the truth of who he is in God's eyes. That's the truth that we must grasp this morning. As I said, if it can go from here to here, that six inches, it changes everything. Have you ever been to a place like Six Flags before where uh, you, you, you can on the spot sit down and, th- and someone will draw a caricature of you? Have, you? have you ever done this? Okay. It's like, it, here's what you would look like if you were hunting pesky wabbits. <laughs> you see, w- what they do is they exaggerate already uh, prominent features about you, all right? Which, by the way, we already hate about ourselves. So thank you very much. For me, it's my pointy nose and pointy chin. Okay, I have a pointy chin and it's actually a butt chin and that's what this, this uh, beard is doing. It's covering that up because I have very sharp features. So why would we pay someone to make fun of us? 
you know, I'm feeling pretty good today. Uh, I think I could take a, a, a drop kick to the, my self-esteem here and take it down a few notches. Now, I say that as a joke, but in reality, I haven't met a person alive who isn't haunted by thoughts like, am I good enough? If only I were more of a leader, quicker on my feet, less impulsive. Why didn't God make me more like him or her? Lord, why did I draw the short straw whenever it came to giftings? Enter Psalm 139. As we walk through, we will see sections, attributes of God's omniscience, omnipresence, the fact that God is all something, but watch, pay special attention to the way that it begins to apply to us. So the first uh, six verses... God's omniscience. God knows all things, as David begins to tell us and unfold. But here's the deal. He doesn't leave it out there. As God, the supercomputer who knows all facts, that's not the point. David says, I am known by God. God, you have searched me and known me. Do you ever feel misunderstood as if no one gets you? But I didn't mean it that way. Don't take it that way. My children are always pleading with me to understand their perspective. God gets you. He gets the way you think. Your likes and your dislikes, all of your quirks. The fact that you tie your left shoe first, always. Or the fact that you insist that the toilet paper roll under. Now let's settle this once and for all. The picture you see on the screen is the patent for the toilet paper. And it is supposed to go over. You need to understand this. This is very important. Guys, I came armed for battle this morning, all right? And so you need to know, if you invite me over to your house and that toilet paper is rolling under, I am judging you just a little bit in my mind. (laughs) But here's the deal. All those quirks, right? We are such quirky people. We have to have it, whether you, you squeeze the toothpaste or you roll the toothpaste. God gets you. David says, he searched me, which means the God of the universe isn't too busy to actively focus on you. You know how often my kids say, dad, look at me, watch me, I've got something to do. Most recently, uh, Lily was, was showing me her flips on the trampoline, right? But there's this constantly, look, look. Your heavenly father looks. He knows your every move. When I sit down, when I rise up. Some of you wear an Apple watch that counts your steps each day. And you hope to get to that ultimate goal of 10,000 steps. And my wife has one and we, she celebrates at the end of this. She's got to close that. I got my steps in today. Here's the deal. God can chart every one of your steps. But those aren't just facts. They are to him intimate details about you. David writes, you understand my thoughts. Did you know that the average person has 50 to 70,000 thoughts a day? That's 25 million thoughts a year and 1.8 billion thoughts in a lifetime. He knows every thought. He understands the way you think. Right? You know how often we're so misunderstood. He understands the way you think. 
David says, every word before I speak it. Here's another fun fact. Did you know that men in an average day will speak 7,000 words? Anticipation here, right? (laughs) Women speak on an average day 20,000 words. That means women will speak 300 million words in a lifetime. Now, women, I don't get that. I don't get that. And you don't understand how men could, could go on a three-hour car ride and you say, oh, well, what did you guys talk about? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. But God does. God gets that. He is intimately equated with all of our ways, all of them, even your sins. You see, when I talk about how God knows everything, everything you think, even the words before they come out, he knows it all. That could could be comforting, but that could at the same time be haunting. That That could be convicting. We, we, we could have, you mean he knows all of my thoughts? I just want to hide. There is not, no one would be my friend if they knew everything that I thought. But listen to this. Look at verse five. After it say, says all of that, it says, you place your hand upon me. As a father would bless his own child. Think about that, an intimate touch, a touch of intimacy. After it says, you know every one of my thoughts, you place your hand upon me. That God knows everything, our sin in its ugliest form, our deepest shame, and still knowing all of that, he sent his son. That's the intimacy here. Verses seven through 12, it begins to talk about God's omnipresence. God is everywhere. There is nowhere that is not his domain that he is not, but it applies it to us. I think of my kids when they were real little and they were on the monkey bars. We would, we would go to a playground and I would have to lift them up and this would be the first time that they would go through the monkey bars and where is dad? Or right underneath, right? The whole time, trying to give confidence and assurance that says, I promise you, you cannot out monkey bar me. I will be here the whole time, right? I've got you. Just trust this. You focus, I'm right here. You cannot outmaneuver him. In verses one through six, God was the subject, but you see a sharp turn here in the text where David becomes the subject or you and I now become the subject. What God is saying or what David is saying is that no matter where I go, I cannot escape him. I cannot outrun him. There's nowhere that is not his domain. If I go to the highest mountain, which by the way is 29,000 feet above sea level, you are there. If I go to the deepest sea, which is 36,000 feet below sea level, God is there. But listen, he's not just saying God is there because look at verse 10. He says, even there, your hand will lead me and will hold me. Remember the hand of blessing. That is that even if I take a wrong turn, even if I step outside of your will, God, you will not abandon me. When I'm blinded by my own circumstances and the only way I can describe what I'm going through is darkness, it is light to you. God, your hand will never leave me. Let me ask you, church, is there someone here who would give testimony, who would be able to to shout out, you know what, God's hand. When the path was dark and you did not know the way, 
his hand. When you were drowning in the deep of your own sin, his hand. When you were financially backed into a corner, his hand. When every door was closed and you were forced to wait, his hand. When health failed and pain demanded to be heard, his hand. When the sorrow of death swept over like the sea billows roll, his hand. That yes, God, the darkness is light to you and your hand will lead me and you will not forsake me. Verses 13 through 16, David moves into the intimacy of being made specifically by God. The God you formed me in my mother's womb. You were there when, I, when my heart did its first beat six weeks inside my mother's womb. The first hiccup at 11 weeks. The first time we dreamed and declared, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Made in the image of God. You see, Lily wants straight hair. Ian always wanted spiky hair. And Daddy just wants his hair back. But everyone wants to be somebody else. A little taller, a little narrower. But God knit you. God knit you. Did you know science is still discovering it? insane, just ridiculous facts. Did you know that inside one single cell, there is six feet of DNA? Six feet of DNA inside one single cell. And your DNA is your instruction book for how God made you, right? It, 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 tells you. Uh, it, it's the instruction book of, I'm supposed to, at, at 41 years of age, look like this, okay? Probably a little slender, all right? The average person has 37 trillion cells. That's, 22 tri uh, that's 222 trillion feet of DNA or 42 billion miles of genetic information rolled up inside of you. Catch this, that's the distance from the sun to Pluto 11 times. Rolled up inside of you, your instruction book. Because God knit you in your mother's womb. You may be thinking, Pastor, this sure is man-centered teaching, but I'm just following the psalm. I'm just following the psalm, which, which just exclaims this, this magnificent truth. How can the all-knowing, ever-present God be that mindful of me? But he is. Verse 17, how precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. All right, one last mind-numbing fact. All right, you, you can Google this. That's how I found it, all right? Uh, if you take the amount of grains that are in a teaspoon, and then you begin to do math, just multiply uh, amount of sand on beaches and deserts, and you ask the question, how much sand is on this earth? Seven quintillion, 500 quadrillion grains of sand. That's 7.5 to the 18th power. God's thoughts towards you outnumber that. But look back again at verse 17 because it says, how precious are your thoughts towards me. He likes you. He likes you. 
As a parent, there, there have been moments where, where you've just been exhausted with your kids all day and you couldn't wait to get them in bed and then, and then you get them in bed and then you, you come back right before you go to bed and you stand in the doorway and you look. You've probably been there as, as a parent or a grandparent. And because they're finally still, your heart just sings over them. And you say, if they only knew how much I love them, if they only knew my thoughts towards them, you want to somehow pour it out and allow them to drink in what you feel towards them. So now, as you get to verses 19 and 22, when David has enemies who are speaking evil against God, David gets this passion that rises up. He, he must defend God who is so good towards him, he must rise up and speak. Those who speak about God with no knowledge and their tribute to God, no worth, David says, they're not allowed to define him. They will not be the ones who speak about who God is or how he is. No, no, no. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you. That's why David rises up with so much passion. And then you get to the final, the, the end of the psalm, with one incredible application point. It's verses 23 and 24, where David says, Search me and know my heart. Now, David's already said in verse one that God has already searched him and already knows all things, okay? So why is he asking God to search him here? Catch this. You see, because David already knows the truth up here about who he is in God's eyes, but he's having a hard time believing it. Do you? You see, he knows that there is a difference between our head knowledge and our heart knowledge. And he's asking God to reveal in him to, if there is any unbelief, if there are any anxious thoughts inside of him. You see, we are strange creatures whenever we think about how we carry around the wounds of our enemies. All right, someone insulted you a month ago and you can't tell enough people about it. A hundred people tell me great sermon, one person tells me it stinks, what do I remember? We carry these wounds around like baggage and that ultimately result in us being angry and hurtful or insecure and anxious. This is why David says, reveal to me if I have any anxious or hurtful thoughts. Look proportionately at the amount of space that the psalmist gives to God's words versus his enemies. The question is, is who are you listening to? Are you listening to what the king of the universe says about you or to someone who wakes up with stinky breath and needs to take naps. Catch this, because I want to press into this final moment. Because when you work through the psalm, after David has articulated all that God reveals and thinks about him, 
and you contrast that to the enemies, David, at the very end, he, he stands before God in this most incredible, vulnerable moment and says, God, would you search me? And would you reveal to me? Even though God already knows, it's David's response. God, would you search me? And would you know me? That is, he trusts the Father that now he is welcoming him in for examination. Would you do that this morning? Would we, as God's people, be willing to open up and be vulnerable and say to the Holy Spirit, would you search my heart and my thoughts? Would you see if there is any unbelief? Am I believing the lies of the enemy? Am I giving more weight and credence to what the enemies of God think rather than what you think? God, would you stir me with the affections for Jesus? Because when that happens, everything changes. When it moves from our head to our heart, suddenly we begin to overflow and live out the love of God. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we do in a moment of vulnerability and quietness right now, all across this room, say to you, search me. Would you reveal if there's any unbelief in us? Would you reveal lies that we are believing that are not of you? Father, I know all across this room there are those that have deep hurts and wounds from the way that they relate to their parents, the way that they relate to their spouse and their children, even wounds they carry from a, from a child over what they were told they were and how they were defined. Father, would you speak life into the depth of their soul? That they are not a mistake. That you have knit them. And that you sing over them. You have given your son because of your love for them. Lord Jesus, help us this day to drink deeper. To walk out changed. Because we know you more. We pray that in Jesus' name.